and we're currently funded as an operational group until March 2021. And the aims of the group at the moment are to share resources and knowledge on mob grazing with a much wider network of farmers, crofters and land managers. Uh, and we've been doing that in loads of different ways. Uh, hopefully many of you will have seen the farmer videos that have been made um, by some of the folk that are on this call this evening. Uh, we also have web resources and other, other ways to share knowledge and a Facebook group as well um, for mob grazers. And we're also working on developing benchmarking tools to measure the ecological, financial and social benefits of mob grazing. Uh, in particular, we're looking at biodiversity measures um, at the moment and trying to develop methodologies around that. Uh, so one of the ways you can get information is on our Mob Grazing Resource Hub, uh, which is on the Soil Association's website. We can share a link to that as well um, in a follow-up email. So in there we have all kinds of information and we're building on it all the time. Uh, so we have information about what mob grazing is, um, why, why you might want to mob graze, some of the benefits, and also quite a few um, resources on, on how to get started, uh, which are things like the videos that we've been making. So yeah, you can access all of the videos that farmers have been making on uh, playlists on YouTube and they're linked from the website. So they're quite easy to find. Uh, and we have all of the outwintering videos that have been made um, by Heather and Philip and Catherine and Roger are all in one playlist. So they're easy to find. We've also got some upcoming events. Um, we have three agroforestry events over the next few weeks. Uh, the, the next one is next Thursday, and it's all about agroforestry on crofts. Uh, and then we also have another mob grazing Q&A in a month's time, exactly. Uh, and that will be following some more videos that are being made, uh, which start next week. Um, and they'll, they'll be coming out every week. So keep an eye on that. So. Um, what we're going to do now is just we're really keen to find out uh, where people are from and um, what, how you farm and if you're doing mob grazing at the moment. So if you have a smartphone, uh, it would be great if you could go to menti.com, the, the web address is there, and type in that code uh, 274826. It's quite easy to access. And that'll be a way that you can actually take part in a poll um, so that we can find out a bit more about the audience. If you don't have a smartphone or are working on desktop, um, this there's a link shared in the chat that will take you to, you can open another window and do it that way. So how do you access chat? The chat is um, a little bubble sort of box speech box that should be visible um, on your toolbar potentially at the top. Can you show the code again please? Yep, it, can you, it should be in the chat as well but there's the code again. Has everyone got that? give a shout i can't see anybody so um i can only hear you but uh hopefully it will be in the chat as well i so still gonna... can't find a speech bubble anywhere but it doesn't matter it doesn't look like it's been enabled for a chat oh, okay um anna could you enable the chat or do i have to do that it should be enabled so um so yeah, I'm trying to see if there's another way, but it should just open up in the top or in the lower part of your uh, of your of your screen. You should have a toolbar, and it should be there. If it's not there, maybe if you're connecting from uh, Safari, sometimes it has trouble with that. I see it. It's on the side of my screen. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to uh, plow ahead. Hopefully everyone's had a chance to get the code here. It's only a short yeah. poll, so it's not the end of the world if you can't do it. Um, it shouldn't affect the rest of the session, but OK. So. Yeah, go ahead and let us know where you're based.
great. We've got quite a lot of folk in Scotland and elsewhere as well. Okay, I'm going to jump ahead to the next question. What animals are you keeping currently? You can answer as, as many options as you want. Great, lots of cattle and quite a lot of horses. Interesting. Okay, I'll jump ahead. Are you currently mob grazing? Great. Brilliant. It's a really big number of people hoping to start. That's really interesting. Okay. And it might be that we haven't got all the right the right options, but just to get a, a kind of sense, what are some of the barriers to outwintering for you? Um, fears about poaching. Uh, for anyone that's uh, from elsewhere that maybe poaching isn't, I don't know if that's a term used everywhere, but um, that would be damaging, damaging the soil or the pasture in wet weather. If anyone wants to share if the other other issues they have in the chat, if you're able to access the chat, that would be really helpful as well. So the majority of people, it's fears about poaching, shelter, pasture growth are all concerns, but poaching seems to be the highest. So hopefully we'll uh, be looking at all of that. Um, so what we're going to do with the questions as we go through, um, because we were worried about not everyone being able to access the chat, and also we have a lot of people on the call, we're going to use Mentimeter for your questions. So um, you can just keep this open um, and hopefully add your questions in and you can also upvote other people's questions as they come up so if you see a question that you really want answered you can give it a thumbs up um, and you should be able to see everyone else's questions as we go along so i'm going to stop sharing my screen okay and we'll get started with so um just to give some introductions to our panel um we've got uh, emily grant who's uh, going to be hosting the conversation with the farmers um emily is an independent agricultural advisor a farmer and a real grazing specialist um so we're lucky to have her this evening and she's been involved in our benchmarking project uh, with the group uh, and then we have our wonderful farmers. Um, we have Roger Dixon Spain from the Salon Project in Lismore. He's given us a wave. I'll let everyone introduce themselves properly in a minute. Um, we've got Catherine Sharp from up uh, in the Highlands. Catherine's a new entrant farmer and she's in a lot of snow just now. Uh, and we have Heather and Philip Close, Team Close uh, in South Ayrshire. Uh, and they're going to be speaking to us as well. So I will um, pass over to Emily uh, and also just to highlight that um, all of our farmers really know their own systems really well, but um, we're all on a journey. So I wanted to sort of start with the idea that everyone in the group is on a journey of learning. We're all observing and 
changing practice as we go along. So although they are really knowledgeable about what they're doing, um, every system is different and we want to emphasize that everyone is the expert on their own farm. So I just wanted to start with that, but I'll pass over to Emily to get things kicked off. Thank you very much, Clem. Um, yes, thank you. And I think in in many ways, um, we're, we're lucky to farm in a temperate maritime climate. And I think, I don't know if the, there are people here on the the cool across from the states, I think there's there's various parts of the world that that um, you know maybe don't have the benefits of the thing. The one thing we can pretty well guarantee is in Scotland is that we will get rain. Um, so, but I think yeah, farming in 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 wetter areas can throw up some real challenges, um, and particularly I think. You know, what's pertinent just now is um, outwintering is a particular challenge um, and also things like health issues such as liver fluke. So um, as Clem said, I think there's there's some experiences within the group of um, how they are managing to farm in a wet climate. So we'll, what we'll do with the chat is we'll we'll hear an introduction from everybody initially. So before we go into individual questions, we'll just get each each three of you just to introduce your farm and um, you know give us the the critical information like what your rainfall is, what your soil types are, and and what kind of farming system you have. And then we'll we'll try and tease out as we go through with just some some general questions about how you're managing um, farming in wetter conditions. So I am yeah going to start as I said with you individually. So this is literally guys your your elevator pitch. And we're only going from floors one to five for this. So it's just it's the key information, as I said, of your your kind of average rainfall and your farm type, just to, just to let everybody in the audience have an understanding of of what your system's like. So, Catherine, first, do you want to do you want to kick off with a quick introduction to your farm? Sure. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um, so hello, I'm Catherine. Um, I have a farm in the uplands just near Inverness. Uh, it's about 70 acres. Um, quite a lot of it's either wet or rough grazing. I have about uh, just over a thousand millimetres of rain a year, um, which is about 42 inches. But I also have quite a lot of seepages, little burns, bogs and stuff as well. So it's there's some bits that are always wet. Um, and um yeah i run sheep in the mob grazing group um which is used hogs and lambs i just have one mob but i do have another group of animals which are all my naughty sheep that won't mob graze um and my cattle which i just don't feel confident enough to mob graze yet because of my shelter um yeah. Okay. And soil types. You have a bit of a range of soil types on farm. Oh, is sorry. That right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm mainly on yeah. clay and peaty glaze. I think, like our subsoils, glacial grit. But I've got peat bogs and um, a lot of sort of heath nearby. So yeah, holds the yeah. water well. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. And we'll we'll come on to another part actually, because I think it is quite pertinent. But but Catherine's obviously in the Highlands, where uh, not only does she have to contend with wet weather, she also has to contend with some pretty cold weather as well. So so, but we'll touch on that as we go through, Catherine, as well. Okay, I'm going to pass on next to Roger, please. Roger, your uh, brief introduction to your farm, your system. Um, hi, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, all the sort of detail of this is on the videos if you care to watch them. But just to uh, just to summarise, we're farming on an island called Lismore in the Inner Hebrides. We've got 74 acres of clay loam over Daradian uh, limestone. It's alkaline with acid patches. Um, we we have a rainfall. Well, rainfall this year was 90.79 inches. 2,307 millimetres. Rolling average is 1,791.8 millimetres, so 70.54 inches, so it's really wet. Uh, we've got 21.56 uh, acres of flat, what you call flat pastures, but none of it's actually very flat. 14.5 acres of rock and hill, 11.7 acres of shoreline, um, uh, a total of 25.99 acres of stockpile and 27.5 acres of non-intervention and woodland. We've got 84 virtual paddocks, 15 sheep, 10 highland cattle, a laying flock, uh, pastured broilers, um, uh, which uh, we hope is going to be our centre-piece enterprise, it's going to be starting this next year. We're building a micro-slaughtery at the moment. 
um, and we fought for and achieved uh, uh, a license to kill on farm and were the first new um, entrance into the Scottish poultry industry since devolution in 1998. Um, we run um, uh, a Watock welfare at time of killing courses here and we're officially now trainers for Scotland. We got a tourist offer in the form of a successful off-grid bothy and we run and facilitate courses here to teach and inform on regenerative agriculture and other subjects and everything that we produce here is sold direct to the public um, uh, with a mile radius of the farm. Um, Great. Would you like me to go any further than that at the moment? Do you want me to go into that? No, I think, I think that's... No, no, we'll we'll come on to questions um, as we as we go through, Roger. So I think great, thank you very much. That's a that's a great introduction, and just to kind of set the context for for everybody listening. Okay, so next again, elevator pitch for Team Close, and I don't know if Team Close has decided who's going to speak, but I'm happy whoever speaks. <laughs> I, I'm from my daughter Heather here. Um, we've got a farm in South Ayrshire near Turnberry, about a mile and a half from the coast. 50 to 140 meters elevation. Uh, the underlying soil is glacial till, which is expressed as a good loam, uh, several feet thick or more usually. We uh, have about 330 acres, of which about 280 acres are grazing land. It's permanent pasture. Uh, the farm had been managed to support a widow for 60 years before, and fields have rarely been plowed, so it's permanent pasture with largely native grasses, herbs, and legumes of various types, usually somewhere between 25 to 30 or 40 different species, uh, which I think is really fantastic as I'm learning. We have, I started out 20, well, 15 years ago, breeding pedigree Angus. I didn't like the large size, and I thought I wanted to expand the herd, and I couldn't see putting up buildings. So we started out grazing, out wintering on the soft ground, which is not done here normally. They do it on along the shore or whatever, where it's sandy or hard rock. Uh, so we've learned a lot, and we've taken, a lot of the farm initially was left out to for annual grazings and we've taken that in hand over the last 10 years and the last two years we're managing all the farm ourselves. Our current herd is 74 animals, predominantly Aberdeen Angus, but we also have six, no eight traditional Hereford type animals uh, because uh, they're smaller framed and uh, they're Got more more to them generally than most of the Angus, uh, which lost a lot of their character from 50 years ago with uh, going large. Uh, rainfall is uh, about just over a meter to a meter and a half. Last year was a meter and a half. Uh, much of that in the winter, we don't get much evaporation, uh, and we've had a long learning journey and are still on it. Not, not there by Perfect. any means. Uh, Great. I guess. Okay. Yeah. Sorry for what? Well, yeah, and we'll come on to to bits and pieces like genetics too as as we go through the questions. So, um, and I'm also conscious. I'm 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 going to go to to Catherine first as well because Catherine's in a pretty snowy part of the country, which I think it's um, it may affect Catherine's broadband connection. So I, I want to make sure we get the opportunity to hear from Catherine. So, um. Catherine, you, um, yeah, I mean, I think you've given us a great introduction to mostly sheep, and which generally is, and for those who maybe are from out with this country, um, might not be aware that actually most generally sheep are outwintered um, in Scotland anyway. So it's it's more the issue with cattle that we tend to see people in wintering and um, perhaps have a bit more of a fear of outwintering. But um, you have a really clear plan and strategy in place for being able to manage your wet areas. And I know you've put a grazing plan in place. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what kind of things you're thinking about when you're drawing up that plan? Uh, yeah, sure. I, 
I don't know if I would say it was very clear. I mean, I, it, it becomes slightly less murky as we go through the year and then I sort of learn something new next year. Uh, but yeah, I mean, most of the plan that I've got for this coming year has come from just observing what's happened as I've mob grazed um, through the last year. So um, some areas, so last winter we had uh, only we only had snow on the ground for a couple of weeks um, and I did keep the sheep in a, a few areas uh, quite a lot longer and just um, fed them hay on the ground and in those areas there's actually quite a good um, like flourishing of forget-me-nots and things in the wetter bits um, so I haven't been too worried about keeping them on um, on areas with now we've had snow on the ground for over a month um, a bit longer in feeding more hay there um, because it, if anything did seem to do it good last winter um, so yeah I'm keeping them in the paddocks for up to about up to a week depending on what the weather's like and how much like poo there is basically if it gets really pooey then I move them on um, but uh, but yeah we are because it's harder to get impact the sort of trampling effect with sheep then in winter with snow and hay it's that sort of where I can really target little areas for that um, and then yeah. in other, other bits of the farm I, it's just been really what I've seen coming up but I haven't yeah I've just been trying to go th through um, and the rough bits of uh, the farm that do tend to be wetter by the heath, like with the heath and the burn, um, and they have loads of amazing um, wetland flowers. So what I did last year, which seemed to work really well, was I grazed them in sort of early spring, um, about February and March, March, for about, for about um, uh, three, three weeks. weeks. And then, and I, then they I, were they there, there for there again a couple of weeks, weeks. In, later in the summer. Uh, and that seemed to work really well. Um, so I'm going to do that again. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. And are, are there specific areas, which I assume they are because you, you've got quite a range of habitat types, but specific areas that you won't put stock on during the winter? So in your plan, do you have a, you know key areas that you're, you're going to be wintering the sheep on? Um, yeah, the plan, I... Um, Yes, for this year, I have got that plan. Last year, it didn't work out because I didn't castrate my first lot of lambs, um, but because I raised them to be hogs, oh, all sorts of problems happened. But the, last year, I did castrate my lambs so um, I can keep them all in the mob and not have so many worries at topping time. Um, so, yeah, last autumn, the tups were in the place where there shouldn't have been any sheep for the winter <laughs> um but yeah this year that will be different and that will be so basically i'm keeping them off an area that i would like to be hay meadow um until the early spring and then we're going to graze it quite hard and then come off it again until like late summer um so so yeah there are a few areas that i don't put them on um but it's not but yeah, it's more about what I want to grow there rather than um, the how wet it is. At the moment, with it being so cold, it's been quite useful because the really wet bits, which we're actually going through at the moment, are frozen, so they're not sinking in. They're, uh, they're sort of, yeah. Yeah. Better. <laughs> no, well, that's it. Yes. <laughs> no, hard ground's always valuable. Yeah. And uh, obviously, I think because you, you're, you'll you be getting a harder winter, or as in more snow and temperatures have been lower this winter so far. Um, are you actually making hay on the unit or do you have, you know, what's your plan B? Because obviously, even if you stockpiled grass, um, this is the, the downside of, of having snow and probably the amounts of snow that you're getting as well and um, so kind of really the question is about what's your plan b how are you managing it um for these kind of periods yeah i yeah i've bought in a lot more hay than i was expecting this winter <laughs> um i i mean i don't think i would be a i wouldn't feel comfortable not having any hay in the shed where i am because as you say of the snowfall um it like yeah, even with stockpile grass, there's only so much the sheep can dig out. Like at the moment, we're 
we've got about a foot of snow on the ground and it's been that for a few weeks so they do dig through it but it's just you know there's only so much they can get um so yeah i do have hay in the shed like i wouldn't expect to not have need hay over the winter um i would like to make it on the farm at the moment i'm buying it in i'd love to find somewhere i could buy in some wildflower hay but at the moment it's just you know pretty standard but nice um and um yeah if the at the moment i don't feel too bad with having sheep out in the field because it's not been that windy although there's been a lot of snow the wind hasn't been that bad whereas if the wind gets really bad and there's a lot of drifting and stuff i will probably take them down to the rough bit by the burn because i have got one of my borders is with a a plantation forest so they can get quite a bit of shelter from along that side so yeah if the if it starts drifting badly we'll go down there and they'll just stay there for however long we need to yeah and bear in mind yeah the the cool temperatures that that you can get to water is obviously a key part of um any kind of rotational grazing system and being able to get water and particularly if you are putting out hay because all of a sudden you're you're on a drier feed which is going to increase water intake and okay you've got snow and they will take some snow but what are your thoughts going ahead in terms of getting water into paddocks so i'm lucky in some areas uh, like i have got quite a lot of burns that run through the farm so where like the field that my cattle are in um has got a burn at the bottom so i don't need to worry about their water which is big relief <laughs> um and the rough area that we'll we're sort of aiming towards where all the heather is and the plantation trees that's got a couple of burns going through it so um so yeah i have i've got running water on the farm which is great because my tap is not running <laughs> um but um, yep. i've been thinking a lot this winter about having a sort of cascading water trough system that goes through um that sort of where there's troughs just always full of fresh water that are constantly um filling and emptying yeah um especially if i do because i do want to start upgrading my cattle but also it would just be so much easier i mean like taking even though it's not that far taking a few buckets over to the sheep each day then the water's frozen by lunchtime <laughs> and um so yeah it's it's been challenging and it's definitely making me think about how i can make my system a lot better um in the for the future yeah. and i think practice run with sheep has been quite good for me um because i'm just i feel much more confident with sheep than with cattle so having all like finding these things out with sheep who you know don't need huge amounts of water has been really useful in making me think what i'll need for when the cows are out mob grazing as well yeah cool great okay i will Catherine, I'll maybe come back to you and ask about fluke if we still have time. And also it may come up as a question about liver fluke if it comes up. So but I'm, I'm slightly conscious of time. So what I'm going to do is move on to Roger. Um, Roger, first of all, do you want to just explain why you are out wintering your stock as well? You've got cattle and sheep. So what are your main reasons to to have a system that you can outwinter on on wet Lismore? <laughs> Uh, well, for those who know my, my history, uh, we came to Scotland not intending to farm at all and just wound up with land and a house and uh, got, got, got into grazing some animals by mistake. Um, and we really didn't want to spend any money. So the first thing about housing is the, just the capital cost. Uh, and we also really weren't interested in making hay or silage. Uh, weren't interested in in the in the business of having to daily feed and bed animals down, mucking out and spreading the muck. And of course, you know, spreading muck up here would just be a non-starter because uh, we can't afford to have tractors running around on on land up here. Uh, it it we you have to do a real rethink on on wet land. I mean, when we got here, we we had problems with uh, with poaching and. Um, the things that you would associate with with uh, with wet soil. I mean, you know, the the worries that people have from what was put up on the screen earlier is mostly about the damage that animals are going to do, particularly in the winter. 
Uh, and I'd just like to say that the thing that we've discovered is that soil biology is a, a foundation of absolutely everything here. And the, the difference between the farm when we got here and the farm now is, is just so, so, it's so different. Uh, uh, you know, we, we find the more we concentrate on soil biology, building topsoil, um, uh, the, 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 the drier our farm gets underfoot. Um, we now don't have a problem with poaching. Uh, we've got uh, a layer of uh, plant litter at soil level, which a hoof just won't go through. So if you go out onto our farm at the moment, it's dry. Um, uh, I think if you watch the videos, there are, um, there are a couple of video shots of our main valley, which used to empty itself through our yard every time we got heavy rain. Um, but it doesn't happen anymore. So we, we've been growing roots, we've been growing soil biology, we've been growing topsoil, and we sort of, by accident, uh, restored our water cycle. And it, and it appears that water is at the heart of absolutely everything here, whether it's falling out of the sky or whether it's water that we have to get to stop and are now banged up in small paddocks. Uh, if, if, we, if we started um, from scratch again, one of the first things we'd do would be to sort water big time. Yeah. So you're saying that, you know, the key differences you're saying is that you've, you've got this um, mat on top of the soil. So your soil's covered because you, you're, your grazing management is such that you're, you're allowing this layer to develop that's, that's protecting the soil. Um, you're also allowing the roots uh, to penetrate a little bit deeper as well, which is allowing that water to infiltrate. Um, how important, do you want to say a little bit about how you do that? And because that's a common question of people here is, is really kind of how do I start? And how important is it for in terms of subdivision to have these paddocks to be able to, for example, have areas that are for wintering only or grow enough um, pasture? And, and as you said, slip into that as well how important water is, is, is getting that uh, into place. I, I think if I say we started all this by accident, I'd just like to encourage people uh, to just start somewhere because when we started, um, we, just, we just started banging up electric fences really to find out, one, whether we could contain animals um, and two, to see what would happen. And um, we've, we've just really um, developed just by by dint of observing what happens on a daily basis and adjusting our uh, management of our animals accordingly. And it, uh, we, we, we were just excited by the prospect of listening to people like Joel Salatum, who was talking about uh, huge increases in production um, uh, and uh, uh, stacking enterprises and all that sort of stuff. And we didn't believe for one minute that it would work. Um, so um, it's not that we knew what we were doing, we certainly didn't, but it was very obvious very quickly uh, that after a, a, a year of a season or two seasons that the croft was completely changing and, and it, was, it, it, it happened as if by magic and you know, we, we suddenly found that this valley was not emptying itself through our yard anymore. I mean, we had a You'll see it on the videos. The, there's a 12-inch pipe that we used to run full bore. Well, some things happened. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't. We didn't have a. We didn't s sort of um, uh, take stock of what was there when we started. So, we can only, you know, we didn't have a datum uh, against which to judge uh, the performance uh, of of the croft or uh, the the increase uh, uh, forage production. Uh, we've got some indication uh, of what's been achieved, uh, but it, it was just a matter of starting somewhere and then realizing, my goodness me, you know, this stuff works. And, and you know, paddock sizes and numbers of animals was something that just developed over time, just through, really just through observation and being able to respond to what we observed. Yeah. And in terms of planning, you you have a um, a set area of the farm is, is used for specifically for your winter grazing. 
So I think this might be different to how some of the others are operating, but you you specifically have an area for wintering. Yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, uh, as you've heard, the rainfall here tends to be um, substantial. So uh, it started off uh, that uh, uh, when we first started, you could not put animals on our low-lying uh, summer grazing land in the winter. And so we have this 15 acres of hill, and we also have a, a bay that's surrounded by uh, 14 acres of uh, rough grazing. And that, that tends to lie rather drier than the rest of the farm. So uh, we started by grazing that during the winter. Um, uh, the other reason that we used that in the winter was that um, uh, and, and we were set stocked at that point, was that we didn't have any water anywhere. So animals had to find their own way to water. Um, and so we allowed them just to travel from whatever rough grazing we had to the only two parts of the farm where water was on the surface. So uh, it, it was a real mess to start with um, uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, organization because we just, you know, you, you couldn't put animals anywhere else other than on this hill. Um, now we can put animals pretty much anywhere we like. Um, but still, yeah. you know, we're using the hill as being one of the drier parts of the farm uh, that we can we can let grow on during the summer. It gets grazed during the summer um, uh, in the early part of the year, and then it's left to grow on until the autumn uh, to to give us a, a you know a, a stockpile to go at in the in the yeah. winter. Yeah. Yeah, which is really important, as as you mentioned, because you're you're not you're not making forage and you're not buying forage in. So, um, yeah, having that ability to stockpile and having having a, a bit of hell as well is a is a real asset. Um, um, I, th I think the secret to it all um, is the restoration of ecosystem processes, water cycle, nutrient cycle, energy flow, and community dynamics being the life both above ground and below ground. If you if you get the water cycle, we, we we restored our water cycle almost by accident. We didn't know what we were doing, and then all of a sudden discovered that actually water was traveling through our landscape in a totally different way. Um, and it, I think it follows that if you if you re, if you restore one ecosystem process as we did, which is water, the rest follows suit. So um, you know uh, we, we've done it. If I say by accident, it's kind of awful, isn't it? But we did it by <laughs> Yeah, great things happen by accident often, <laughs> rather well, than planning. <laughs> we, now we now have a relatively dry farm where we don't have standing water anywhere. So, um, you know, the, yeah. the place is just changing. So I'd say to people who've got wet ground, don't worry about that. Just get into knowing about soil biology and, uh, and ecosystem processes. And if you get your head around that, you, you've got the job done. Thank you. Okay. In close, you've already mentioned what your type for, for outwintering um, is to avoid housing and the costs associated with housing and mucking out sheds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. So, do you want to do you want to tell us a little little bit about how you're running your wintering systems? Because you've obviously got cows, and then you've got following stock as well. So briefly yeah give us an idea of how you're planning that yeah um we have three mobs at the moment so we have the cows two bull calves and some steers in one mob and we're moving them twice daily um they're on deferred grass we use a bat latch to move them for the second part of the day and um, we find we for would... those heather sorry yeah, Heather. For those who maybe don't know what a bat latch is, do you want to just explain how it's, the bat latch works? It's a solar-powered automatic gate. Um, you can preset the timer, so you just set it up. It's it's on a spring. Um, it makes a beep, beep, beep before it goes off. Oh, I can't hear you. Sorry, Emily. You're saying something. You're good. Sorry, I can't hear Emily. I'll, I'll just carry on until she waves at me um so we have yeah, okay we have the go yeah so we divide each we give them more area than we do in the summer because it's wetter 
and when the grass is trampled in the winter. Can you hear me, Emily? I can hear <laughs> um, I'll just carry on. So yeah, so yeah. we have we, we give them more um, area in the winter because the grass, when it's when it's wet, it gets trampled down further more quickly. So by having the second move of the day, they get fresh grass in the morning, um, and you get um, fresh grass in the afternoon. And the cows seem happy with that. Um, we have a second mob, which is the youngsters. So we have the um, the calves and the yearling heifers. We give them a bit larger area and we only move them once a day we don't think we're grazing the cows quite non-selectively which is a, a new um we've just started doing that this year so it's not fully non-selective but we're starting to push them a bit further the younger stock we don't push as hard so we give them a larger area um, we're now supplementing them with haylage we started about a week ago which is six weeks later than last year so we're really pleased with that and then we have a separate mob, which is the five balls, and we move them once every two or three days. We have a portable water trough that we move along with each mob. That's a new addition this year. Last year, we've got permanent um, water troughs to each of the fields. And last year we had the cows tracking back to those each day. But now we have um, the temporary water trough, which is really easy to move. It's really quick filling. And we move that with the cows each day, which reduces the poaching a lot around the water drops. So, yeah, so basically you're, you're setting up your infrastructure that you're reducing poaching by having mobile water troughs. And also the, the, batch, la the batch is allowing you to have an additional move yeah. in the day so that the amount of time that cows spend area of ground is reduced it obviously saves you having to go back out to shift an electric if the automatic that yeah it's working and it helps balance the real the, the green of the grass with the um older grass underneath it seems to work better in the cow's yeah. room by having the two moves otherwise they'll eat all the green stuff first and then they'll eat all the yellow stuff this forces them to eat them a bit together which is better for them yeah and in terms of kind of running your winter too, and I mean, one of the key um, values that suckler cows have as well is the ability to lay down fat in late summer and um, early autumn. How important is that to your system to, for your cows to be carrying some condition going into the winter um, as a way of buffering? Because obviously, um, you know, we don't have much grass growth during this period. Yeah. Um, well, I learned my lesson early on the first winter. Uh, winter I took, they were large Angus. The, the cows were mature weight, eight to 900 kilos. Uh, and unfortunately, I had some genetics with the mystatin gene in it. And I had a calf that had it both. And she looked more continental than most continentals. Very little fat on her. And she lost about 25 kilos in weight, which is basically muscle that winter uh the ones that had a fat layer on uh came through fine uh so i eliminated the my, my statin gene um uh, and i've selected just natural selection of cows perform we get ones that have a good fat cover and uh also seem to have more of the intermuscular fat too uh in the aberdeen angus breed now we we are in the top 10 or 20 percent for fat back fat which is something that used to be bad but i think people are starting to appreciate it now but you have to have fat to get through winter you have to have fat to maintain condition to calf and for the cow to come back cycle back and get in calf again uh so uh that's very important lean and mean doesn't do it when you're out wintering uh so i, I make that uh now a lot of people when they're starting out they, they'll start with what they've got, probably. Uh, and you have to select the animals that perform for you. Uh, we look at, do they come through the winter? We're not expecting them to, well, they maintain decent condition. Uh, 
but you know they're not going to get fat over winter but they have to come out if we cap in from late march on through april and early may they have to calf on their own and have a calf up and suckling them within an hour uh and the calf be ready to walk back to the barn within three or four hours which is two three hundred meters if they can't do that they get called uh because I'm too old to go out there and try and pull calves and worry about calves, cows calving. Uh, yeah. But they have a problem, I try to help them, but I'm not going to do that as a routine. Uh, so, you know, they need, you need that fat to get through the winter, to come around to calf, calf successfully, and then to get from calf yeah. again. Very important. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Thing Can I... Head- Okay, go ahead. Sorry, Philip. Yeah, can I, because it, there's, you also have another, I'm going to ask about another bit, handy bit of kit that you have, because um, as you've mentioned, your young stock are also um, being fed silage as well as you, as you go through winter. Um, and there's also a question on the chat about, is, is anybody feeding out hay daily with tract? But do you want to explain a little bit about your, your bale unroller? We have a very simple bale unroller that I think, the design originated in New Zealand. Uh, if you look at the video on, it's on one of the videos, right? Uh, the equipment. You will see that there. Uh, it's very simple and basic. We've got bales set out in certain fields strategically on the higher parts of the field, so we don't have to pull them uphill. I will. I've just I've seen the question, and um, it's asking about the tractor. So last year, oh, the tractor. last year we did take the bales out each every couple of days with the tractor and left huge big track marks um, at, at the entrance. So this year, to avoid that, we all, we had the bale on roller then, but we had to get the bales out to the field so we use a tractor for that. This year we've strategically placed the bales, and we can use the quad bike with the bale on roller to pull them in. So there's still a little bit of damage around gates, but it's a lot less than there was, and we we placed the bales. When they were cut, so midsummer. And, and we roll out the bales. So we don't have a, one yeah. bale there and all the animals around it making a great big mess. That takes a lot longer to recover. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And it, yeah. So uh, basically, you're 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 reducing that because you don't have a ring feeder. You're reducing no. that that area of poaching yeah. because because you spread it out. You're also actually spreading if there is a little bit of waste. You're spreading that bit of fertility as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's left over. Yes. Yeah, I'll yeah. say the other thing about poaching. If if you're going to be running machinery on it and over, uh, you can worry more about poaching. But if you're not running machinery over, you, you're going to get some poaching, whatever. But you leave it rest, it and it recovers well. It maybe recovers better. Uh, so I don't yeah. see a serious concern unless you are want to run some high spec machinery over it later on uh you know yeah. and we are on permanent pasture yeah. Make yeah exactly perfect okay um time's really galloped on guys and we need to move on to some of the questions but i think that was quite a, a pertinent place to stop and i think i think philip's probably covered off as well one of the the, the key things about having the infrastructure to allow um, mob grazing or, or whatever kind of grazing system you're running is is that ability to allow pasture just to to have that rest when it has had stock on it. So, you know, the ability to reduce the amount of time that, that stock are on pasture and then the rest period in that seems to be really key in giving the soil some resilience um, to, to poaching. So without further ado, Clem <laughs> is gonna yep. hopefully yeah, try and yeah. untangle I'm, some I'm, of those questions i'm on it with the questions uh we have 48 questions so we're not going to get through them all um but can i encourage people there are some questions coming through in the chat but if you could possibly use the mentimeter and you can upvote questions that are already there because we're clearly not going to get through any new ones so i recommend you have a look at the mentimeter the link is in the chat or the code is in the chat and you can uh select but anyway so the top question at the moment um, is around the amount of land um, that you dedicate um, per, per sheep or cow. So the, que- the question is, is there a guide to the amount of land you should dedicate per sheep or per cow per day? Would this change if you had cattle and sheep in together? 
So I don't know who we should put that to just now, but that's uh, got our top question at the moment. So kind of predicting and allocating cool. land. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure how you would work it out for the whole year, but when I started, we did the, we started holistic plan grazing 18 months ago and I didn't, I couldn't visualize how much space I needed to allow for the mob, but you can get the sword sticks and then there's a cut there's, so you measure the height of the grass seed and the sword stick that will give you the dry matter per hectare you know the number of cows that you have they have certain requirements dependent on um what stage they're at mm. if they're lactating it's three percent three point five percent um if they're not then it's one and you can calculate it from that um as a rough guide we find that it, it's not so accurate because we have um, more diverse pastures than the sword sticks are used to calculating, I think. Um, but that's a good starting point. And then you observe the cattle and adjust um, as the, required. The big thing is once you get started, observe how much they take. Yeah. And, and you, it's really an observation. You can do all these measurements, but key is observation. And we've gone to longer rest periods and taller grass. And these sticks aren't useful for that. No, it's a good starting point, though. If you want just some, that's, yeah. something, a stick in the ground, then that's, and then you can adjust it up or down, depending. I found. Anyway. Roger, did you want to come in on that quickly? Yeah, I, 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 I agree um, uh, with the notion that it's actually all about observation. I don't think we, you can, you can look at an area of ground and think, well, oh, well, that'll do a cow or a sheep for a day. Uh, but you actually get to know, um, and, and I know that we've been through the business of scoring all our paddocks uh, on productivity, and um, you know we, we we can pretty much bet that um, uh, we'll 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 get it right. Um, you know we don't don't have a a problem with with assessment as such. I think uh, you know the I think the secret to the secret to getting started is to realise that this isn't prescriptive. It's not you can't. You, it's not like a cookbook recipe. Um, you know, your your context and your farm are, are going to be different to everyone else's. And I think you you just have to get started and see what happens. It becomes very obvious as to what you need to do once you've once you've once you've got a paddock set out. And you put the cattle in or cattle and sheep in. We have cattle and sheep together. It seems to work really well. Uh, you sort of get to know. So I think it's experience. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Joel Salatin says all you need is a stout pair of walking shoes, some cheap electric fencing, some animals and just get going. So um, that would be my advice to anybody who is thinking about starting. Great. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to jump to the next question, which is, again, it's it's kind of about numbers and looking for answers. But um, do, do any of you want to reflect on how long you rest paddocks over the winter compared to the summer? So how are you managing rest periods differently between summer and winter? Um, Heather, do you want to come in on that? And then Catherine, maybe? Go ahead. Um, so in the winter, we graze them down and then we basically wait till they come back up in the springtime. So we're because we've started grazing taller grass, we're waiting for the basal leaves to become yellow. So that will probably, we're thinking that's probably four months in the growing season and six months in the non-growing season, um, which seems very long, um, but we are grazing them down quite hard. So we gain time from the density of our grazing, which allows us to leave that amount of time for the rest period. For example, we grazed a 10 hectare field last summer and that took us 49 days to get through. It was, it was a haylage field, it was a field we were hoping to silage. Um, but we did we had rain so we couldn't actually get the, the machines out um, so we used that instead we got 49 days of rest from that which meant all the other fields had that long time to recover which meant we had a nice big tall stock path for the winter so in the summer we're thinking three to four months but we will observe and see and in the winter we're thinking six months um, we're not particularly oh. Oh, sorry Go ahead, Roger, and then if Catherine. We're, we're not particularly worried about rest periods during the winter because the grass isn't growing, um, but we, we've got to leave sufficient time for for a pastures stockpile that's been grazed just to clean itself up. You know, I'm talking about uh, dung and urine. Um, in the in the summertime, 
uh, we'd like to have a minimum of 60, 66 days rest. That's what we started with last year. Um, I've got an average figure for days rest for each paddock, and it turned out at the end of the season to be 82 days. Very pleased with that. Great. Catherine, do you want to feed in on your rest periods? Yeah, um, so last year I did, I gave them quite long rest periods coming out of winter and in the spring. Um, but because I'm quite an exposed site and I'm grazing sheep, um, I actually lost a lot of the grass because it got tall and then it got blown over and then the sheep just wouldn't eat it. So I'm going to be actually going around a little bit quicker in the spring this time, um, just to sort of give it a little skim and um and then do longer rest periods after that so i don't know how that will go but that's what i yeah it didn't quite work out how i planned last year i think i didn't waste the grass because obviously it went to the ground which is lovely um but the sheep didn't get to eat as much as i would like <laughs> they weren't very impressed when they moved into the blown bits great okay um we've got another top question uh on uh, there, there's actually some other questions later on as well about people starting off um, with uh, seed mixes and things like that. But are there any particular grasses or herbs or trees that you are integrating into your system that are reducing poaching or I guess the implication is improving the water cycle? We also have a question a little bit on silvopasture. So if anyone wants to feed back on how they're integrating um herbal pastures or trees into their system to help with with reducing this poaching issue come in on that one i, I think the key here is diversity we were fortunate to have permanent pastures and we've got a variety of grasses a lot of people say they're not good grasses they're not good for this or that but they, they do well. We've got a variety of legumes. We're resting them longer. We're getting things like bird's foot trefoil and vetch come into fields that used to just be on the verge of the roads. Uh, and we've got a lot of forbs, a lot of plantain naturally there. Uh, we planted a herbal lay in one field with chicory and what all, and that's doing well. Um, I don't know about the farms that they've been plowed and cultivated a lot, you may not have a good seed bank. We've got an excellent seed bank here and um, a wide variety. And as we rest the fields longer, we're seeing things come forward that we hadn't been aware of before. So um, you're just going to have, if, if you're just on a clover ryegrass laid, I would suggest getting a herbal lay mix and stitching that in and trying to encourage all those other weeds to come along because most of the weeds are very nutritious at some point of their lifetime. Uh, and the and, deep roots. And you need the deep roots and you need, each of the plant has a different mineral composition. And a variety of plants gives you a more variety of minerals and components and your cattle are healthier. Uh, you, you want to be where you're not having to take minerals out to them. You want that in the soil and in the plants coming to them. And you, for that, you need diversity. In yeah. fact, just on that, before we move to other people answering that one, um, there is that's the other question is about are you supplementing with um, minerals? So maybe if, if everyone could answer that as well as um, any thoughts on trees and herbs and pasture species. So could you just answer that, Philip, about minerals? Yeah. We, I tried mineral buckets years ago. Uh, they didn't need them in the summer and they gorged on them in the winter and I decided that was molasses, so I didn't do that. For a number of years, I'd been giving them uh, all trace high iodine boluses twice a year. Uh, we've stopped that and we've gone to Himalayan salt this year. Uh, and when I do the grass analysis for minerals, we've got most of the minerals there, maybe not quite where you want it, but not far off. So, which may be different than other farms. On a glacial till, if you've got the biology working, you should, in theory, be able to make available just all the minerals you need. Uh, other farms may not have that, uh, but you'll know your farm and work to it. If you get that diversity and the biology working, 
I think you'll need a lot less minerals. And we also, we're, we're planting some willows and we've got some um, ash and I'd like a little medicine cabinet of a, a tree line at some point, but we're, we're slowly working on that. Uh, um, the, uh, I, I think, uh, come back, um, uh, uh, you've just been touched on soil biology, you know, is the symbiosis between plants and animals and the soil food web. You know, if we get that right, then we're starting to draw up uh, nutrients because not only are we sorting our water cycle, we're sorting the nutrient cycle and, and the energy flow, all that stuff comes together. I sort of have a feeling uh, that, that uh, modern agriculture and the way that people have provided minerals for animals is all due to the fact that we've, we're, we're, for the most of the part of the UK and anywhere else in the world, perhaps we're dealing with degraded soil. So, you know, it's not about prescriptively doing anything, it's sticking with the principles that people like Gabe Brown and Joel Salatin and Alan Sabry and all those people suggest, which is, you know, least mechanical disturbance, armor on the soil, as was just been said, diversity, 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 um, growing, growing long roots and having lots of animal impact. And I, and I think then you've got the job done. And Roger, are you, have you got any mineral supplements or did you in a transition towards where you are now, were you supplementing with minerals? Um, no, we, we used to have salt licks and things like that, but they just used to get dissolved by the rain. You know, it's, it's continuously pouring out of the sky. So uh, we, we just decided, um, having listened to the people that we've been following, that all we needed to do was get to grips with how to restore the health of our soil. And I think that we're largely doing that. Thank you. Catherine, you want to feed back? I know you've planted a lot of trees and are looking at trees in your system um as as well as yeah as well as commenting on minerals that would be great yeah sure i think um i have sown i i did buy in a load of seeds in my first year but actually last year i just went and collected all of the seeds from around the farm like the different herbs and stuff that just grow here um and just sort of plunked them on the molehills and i have i mean even just doing it mob grazing for six months i definitely saw a change in the flowers and that that were coming through um from my first summer to last summer um yeah i've planted a lot of hedging so far um so at the moment every field has an edge of um either hedge or shelter belt with very young trees but the aim is that they will be both sort of browsed um fresh but also would like to make some tree hay from minerals through the winter um and also the sort of the the ground where the hedges are will uh, also sort of act as a seed bank if i get the timing of the grazing slightly wrong for certain flowers then the ones that are in um protected by the fencing for the hedges they can sort of flower and set seed as well i've just started planting my first silver pasture like open woodland trees um, I put my first one in a few weeks ago. I've just had a delivery of my next ones. Um, and it's something that I've always wanted to provide um, the animals in the pasture, both for browsing, for, as Heather said, a sort of medicine cabinet. They can help themselves to what they need. So my hedges are really diverse. I think I've got about 27 species in them. And um, we do have a low selenium level here. Um, so I've planted quite a lot of willow as well as an accumulator of that. Um, and um, but yeah, also having the shelter, the shade from the snow, <laughs> um, but also for like scratching on and coat care and things as well. When the trees are big enough, they'll have access to the trunks. But because they'll be moving through so quickly, hopefully they won't do too much damage. Uh, in terms of minerals, at the moment, I um, have got them with Himalayan rock salt and they do they normally get seaweed every few weeks um, from the beach I've not been to the beach for a while so nothing recently um, but I this winter because I've not been able to get seaweed as easily I did buy some like powdered minerals that does have a little bit of molasses in um, but yeah I just I, I was just a bit worried about them um, but I hope to not have to provide them with any minerals when they have got a diverse sort of yeah diverse food to choose from thanks catherine um a question for roger specifically on uh, your slaughter facilities 
Um, is there more information about how you've done that and um, how, how it's working and other people are very interested in, in the slaughter facilities? So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that, that's a slaughter facility for chickens only. I, I hope that's understood. Um, yeah, um, it, it took my wife, Jilly, uh, very nearly three years to get the legislation rewritten to allow us to, to be licensed to kill on farm. Um, we've, we've been wanting to get into pasture broilers, um, but there was, there was a, a, a log jam um, in, in the legislation, which we, I mean, Jilly, um, got it removed. Um, and the condition, uh, one of the conditions was that we became trainers for Scotland at welfare at time of killing. So uh, we, we do that now for Scotland. I think we've trained about 20 something odd people so far. Um, I say 15 to 20, something like that. Um, and we're building a micro slaughtery. I, I think um, we'll have a capacity of doing um, 100, 200 birds a day, something like that with, with four of us. Um, and uh, we're using a, a model that's based on uh, what Richard Perkins has done in Sweden. Um, and uh, we're really looking forward to that. I think um, we're, we're not going to be, we're going to be doing about 500 birds this next year. Uh, we haven't actually built the facility yet. It's uh, we've got all the bits, uh, all the all the materials to build it. Um, we're just waiting for final designs on uh, blast chillers and that sort of stuff. Um, but it's looking exciting. And if people want to get trained with you, how do they how do they go about that? Is there information on your website, or do they contact you, or? Yeah, just give us a ring. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, you, you can uh, you can get our contact details off our website. Uh, Lismore grass-fed beef and lamb and uh, have a word with Julie about it. Yeah, we'll share everyone's um, details in the follow-up email as well. Thanks, Roger. Um, so we have, yeah, we've got quite a few people really wanting to know about managing and controlling fluke. So since we didn't get a chance to speak about that earlier, um, Catherine made a lovely video about how she's been um, trying to manage for fluke. Do you want to just talk about that a little bit, Catherine? Uh, yes, yeah, sure, but, uh, so um, yeah, I do. I have fluke on the farm, but uh, I haven't had too much of a problem with it um, so so far. And um, yeah, I'm going to be doing some fecal egg counts of my ewes in the next couple of weeks to see what their levels are like, see if I need to carry on treating. Uh, but my cows just had a clear fecal sample uh, last week, so that's excellent. Um, but uh, basically, I'm just trying to, I suppose, limit the limit the poo that falls into the water and the sort of watery areas. Um, obviously, it still happens a bit, but I try to not have it there as much when it is really wet and warm. Um, I have got ducks and geese that roam the pastures as normally as well when they're not on lockdown. Um, and the ducks are very good at sort of juggling around in the grass and eating any lots of little things hopefully all those little snails and then I have geese that will graze um graze the grass as well and um, it's sort of digging roots up and things um with the really wet area I have one particular area that's quite big and wet and the geese go on that in the sort of early spring um and sort of graze that off and it seems to be working so far sort of yeah, lots of approach. I've also heard people say that salt helps with fluke as well. Like if they have access to salt, that can help with fluke levels. But that's that's what I'm doing, and it's yeah, it's so going okay so far. <laughs> Does anybody else want to come in on on fluke managing for fluke, Philip? Or yeah, I'll say something. I started out winter in 2010-11. And by 2013, I found I didn't have to treat for worms. And I haven't treated since then. And fluke has been a problem. It's getting to be less of a problem. I don't treat the whole herd now if I have a problem. If I have some animals that show problems, I suspect I'll get a fecal analysis. And if that's got fluke showing, I'll treat that. But uh, I think moving animals daily and having longer rest periods over time, we'll address a lot of those problems. Yeah. Uh, can I second that? 
We don't treat our we don't treat our animals with anything either, um, and I, I think we we have a situation where uh, sheep and cattle grazing together are dead end host for each other's parasites, and we certainly don't have a problem. We have our we have a dung sample tested occasionally, but we've never had a problem. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just trying to prioritise questions here um, with the limited time remaining. Uh, we have a question about. Um, I think I'm going to go to the one about thatch. There's a couple of there's a couple of questions around this mat or thatch, um, and is this the same thing that many farmers harrow out? And also yeah. another question: um, Is it yeah. is the thatch you're talking about, Roger? Is that dead or is it living vegetation? Do you want to talk a bit more about your theories on on the mat and the thatch and how you? It what is. You mean by that? It's compost. <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant stuff you know it's like a, I, okay so my my whole adult life has been in farming and if I'd been in my previous incarnation I'd have had a set of chain harrows out and I'd have harrowed the lot out in the spring uh, it's just it's just destroying you know a part of the life death decomposition deal um, so you know we've got this stuff at soil level it's food for people underground um, and, and it's it's protecting the soil, you know. It's like it's armor on the armor on the soil, a total total protection um, for for soil that doesn't need to see the light of day, doesn't need to be rained on, doesn't need to be blown around by wind. You know, it's uh, um, uh, just wonderful stuff. And and it's like a trampoline, you know. It, you know, a hoof won't go through it. Try and poke a poke a stick through it, you can't get a stick through it. It's just uh, impenetrable. And how does that impact on new new grasses coming through? Is that already decomposing enough that um, yeah. is that to do with your soil biology having improved so much, or are you focusing on animal impact and trampling to to manage that, or how would you say? Do, do, you, do, you, do you know I don't know, um, <laughs> and, and I'm not going to say I don't care, um, but, but you know I've got figures here for what's happened since 2015. 2015, this is cow days, all right? It doesn't matter what cow days are. If people don't understand, it doesn't matter. Um, but, you know, the, the, the metric is the same. It's, uh, it's on the, the 21 acres of graze, summer grazing. 720 cow days in 2015 off the same area of land now. doesn't matter whether the figure's accurate or not. we got 2,361. So it's like a... Um, 327.95 percentage increase in production. Uh, so I, I, I look at that and I think, well, something's happening. Yeah. <laughs> Heather and Philip, do you want to comment at all on, because you're, are you leaving as much, um, are you, you're not doing quite as much trampling on the surface and leaving as much that, or what, what would you say about that? Early on, we were, with the school where you graze the grass, it's about six, eight inches high. The last three years, given the droughts and everything, and, and some training we've been doing, we've gone to much longer rest periods and much older, taller grass, and thicker. And uh, that leaves a lot of thatch. You can go around and leave 10% of that and have four or five times as much on the ground as you did when you left 10% of six or eight inches. Uh, and that's starting to change the soil composition. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, it's helping. I think we'll be where Roger is in a few years. I wanted to, I've always wanted to outwinter a lot more animals I'm doing. I couldn't get that on six or eight inch grass grazing. You just don't have enough to get you through the winter. This long grass grazing, gives me hope that we will be able to double the herd in the next three years and maybe triple in five or six years after that. Uh, there's a lot of experience there, and I'm sure there's a lot of mistakes to be made, but uh, I see that the way to go. But you just have to try it and experiment yeah. on your farm. Each farm is different. Some farms couldn't do what we're doing, and other farms do things we can't do. Uh, okay. Uh, I think I think the difference is, you know, all this stuff is, uh, um, you know, the the savoury uh, uh, metric from 
uh, uh, measuring bare soil is to throw a dark ball dart over your shoulder with a ribbon attached to it so you can find it. And if that dark, if that dark point doesn't hit a stem or a leaf, but hits soil, you've got bare ground. So we had uh, at our last um, assessment, we had between one and two percent bare ground. Well, that's changed a lot because we had a whole heap more back in 2015. So we don't have bare ground. So uh, and I think that's the secret. And this thatch, you know, agriculture, modern agriculture will have, have it that that's a bad thing. I think it's food for your community subsoil. Okay. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple. Oh, yeah, go, Catherine. Go for it. So I just wanted to add, I, I completely agree with what those guys have said. I I remember when I moved onto the farm, I my land had been undergrazed for quite a few years before I got here. Um, so there was a thatch, but it was sort of like a mid-air thatch. It was more just iodized grass. Um, and I was really worried about being able to tackle that with sheep um, because they're just not as heavy and trampoly. Um, but actually, a couple of years later, and it's sorted itself out, really. Like, I think I was worrying about nothing. The snow's probably helped a bit as well, squashing it down. But, um, but yeah, I think don't worry too much about it. It'll sort itself out. Yeah, there's quite a bit of commentary in the chat about this, about defining what the thatch is and and how it's and and what it might indicate about the carbon cycle. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to to something else. Um, there's a couple of questions. Uh, one that that maybe you could answer in one go. Um, but one is about how nutritious is grass during the non-growing season? Is is that an issue? And also, how do you incorporate hay meadows into the system? So if you are trying to grow hay, are how how are you managing that in your grazing planning? But I don't know if anyone could sort of tackle both of those, Heather. Yeah, we, just, we can't tackle the hay meadow, but we did just okay. get forage analysis. In. I've been this <laughs> year doing soil analysis. Well, forage analysis, trying to do it monthly since I think about August, uh, looking for the nutritional values and the mineral values in the soil, in the, the grass. And yesterday I just got some analysis back from the two fields that were currently grazing. And these were taken about three weeks ago. And the dry matter is for one field one point is 11.3 with the me of 10.3 and protein of 16 and the other field would be similar and the consultant who has helped me take the samples he said that is as good or better than a lot of the silage he's been analyzing for farmers this year uh and this is stuff that has been rested since uh, one field's been rested since the beginning of July, and the other one's been rested since the end of July, early August. Yeah, for a bit longer. For a bit longer. So, so that's reassuring for us. So, you know, there is food value. The top is green, and if they just eat that, they're going to piss poo. And the lower stuff is brownish, and if they eat too much of that, the dung is going to be hard and firm. They eat the two, mix it together, and you get a nice cow pie. Great stuff. Does Does anyone want to comment on the hay meadow question? Uh, um, yeah, we used to make hay here, um, but we found um, that the uh, weather windows were too tight for us. We, we were doing it by hand, I mean, with sides. And we made some really good hay, but it was just a too unreliable a way to um, uh, uh, produce winter forage. So uh, we've decided that we're going to import fertility. And uh, so we now feed our cattle on grass nuts um, during the winter. And uh, that seems to be working OK. I don't know if it's the right thing to be doing. Um, but, uh, you know, imported hay is always so variable in quality, can't rely on it. Um, so um, uh, we're using grass nuts at the moment. Catherine, you're trying to develop um, hay meadows. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have any experience of what uh -huh. will happen, but okay. I have a plan, <laughs> um, which is to 
um, graze it pretty hard in the well, probably in March here, so for the when the grass has just started growing, and um, to knock that back a little bit, then leave it for a few months. I'll probably cut it in sort of late June, July, depending on the weather, um, and then I'll probably leave it a couple of months and then graze it again. Um, that's the vague plan at the moment, but I I don't know how it will work out. <laughs> Could I just say that when we were cutting hay by hand, it used to take our pastures a long time to get over it. And uh, oh, we thought, okay. oh, yeah. yeah. Um, how long did you rest them? Um, well, we we just didn't get the we didn't get the recovery that that we would normally expect, um, and we just we just found that, you know, we it it, it appeared to damage um, the pastures, whether it was because we were cutting them too low or we don't really know, um, but it didn't seem to it didn't seem to uh, benefit our pastures at all. In fact, it seemed to damage them, so we stopped doing it. Mm, that would be the on top of which, you know, we, we were doing it by hand and there's only so much you can deal with. There are only two of us. Um, you know, there's only so much that we could make in a, in a, in a five-day period. And we thought, well, well, we better try and make some money out of the farm first before we start investing in any kind of machinery. And that wouldn't need to involve a tractor. It would have to be, a, we've got a two-wheel tractor with a reciprocating bar. Um, so we could cut, we could cut, uh, uh, hay, but bailing it would be a real problem. So, you know, the whole thing is just uh, <clears throat> getting into um, expense and machinery and all that sort of stuff. So we decided, well, we just buy in food uh, for the time being until we got ourselves sorted out. There, there are other members of the mob grazing group that that have, you know, that that are incorporating um, hay or silage or haylage into their into their system. So maybe we could do a little feature on that. Um, uh i just want we're really running out of time it goes so quickly um there's the, the there's so many more questions still to go it's been really helpful having the questions because it actually helps us to think what else do we want to tackle in terms of topics and resources that we might be able to develop as well um i'm going to finish i think with this one around mentoring schemes there's a the question that lots of people have upvoted is there a mentoring scheme available knowing how to start is the biggest barrier but having someone to ask for advice would be very helpful. Um, so I, I think I'm going to answer that, um, which is that we're trying to develop a mentoring scheme um, so that uh, those folks that have been doing it a bit longer could be matched as mentors. We're seeking funding for that. But also just to highlight that we have the Mob Grazing Scotland Facebook group. And although that's not the same as the, an in-depth mentoring scheme, we want to really uh, invigorate that and share as much knowledge through that. Um, there's also a Mob Grazing UK WhatsApp group that um, Robert and Andrew Brewster manage, which is really brilliant. Um, and they'll be speaking at the next um, Q&A and also making some videos along with Johnny Balfour and Lynn and Sandra from Lynn Brett Croft. So we've got a load more farmer videos coming up over the next three weeks. Um, at the next Q&A uh, with, with Lynn Brett Croft, Easter Danoon and um, Balburnie, they'll be looking again at outwintering, but at different systems again. So Johnny's um, integrating his cattle into arable. Um, the, the Brewsters are doing a great deal of work with uh, bale grazing and have brilliant experience of that and are also doing pasture cropping. And Lynn Breck are outwintering and really on it with tree hay and silver pasture. So I recommend that next session for some of those questions relating to that. Um, and also some of our agroforestry sessions will cover a little bit more around um, shelter um, for animals and integrating trees into systems. So hopefully those things will be useful to you. Um, and I just want to say a huge thank you to our wonderful speakers and Emily also for chairing. Um, it's been brilliant having your knowledge here and we're really grateful. <laughs> so thanks. Thanks to you all so much. Um, and we've got a SurveyMonkey little feedback form, which also provides an opportunity for you to um, highlight any other topics or um, areas and things you'd like to cover. But we will 
uh, use these questions that have been generated and all the ones we couldn't answer as ideas for future resources. So that's really helpful to us. Um, and I think, yeah, I'll close up uh, on time. And thank you so much for joining us. And this recording will be available on YouTube and the previous one is available. So um, have a look on our website for that. But we can also do put all the links in follow up emails to all the participants. So thank you and have a lovely evening. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. Thanks. <laughs> Cheerio. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>